Tane se uki anin habe washte dar na stara et lanete tane she to our meaty friends and fam uh, people out there. Uh, yeah, Neil Wayne Jackson at Sigas one. You go to my mother and cheese and sub to you tan. Ute manituan. Ute ocean. Come you signal silk saga neck. It take you upigi go yan. Matsuga nihioe sananuts. Hopsis in the hills, and one gate on his who scoot tian, one gate on Ipagaskini hioyan, maga Pogogan and Askomog, Nigawe. Cap it smart so Nigawe, I know an inton old Niano Sapi or Teponio. Yoguana gage asson out and big scone. Mats went into one gaskeets asin. So I just wanted to say uh, thank you for the opening, Patricia. Uh, thanks to our elder, Lynn and Agnes, a uh, friend of mine. Thank you for him for lifting a pipe this morning. Thanks to our youth panel. Thanks for the supporting Indigenous language revitalization folk who have supported Nihio, Anishinaabe, Michif, Dene Suhtine, Dene Tha, Dene Zad. I don't want to leave anybody out in Dakota and all the other indigenous languages here in Alberta. So what I just mentioned earlier today, earlier in my Gani uh, Hioyan, as I was speaking the language, I don't consider myself a fluent speaker. I understand it. There was that one lady that said she spoke Nihioyan until she was four, and then when she started school, she lost it. Not really, I don't say she, she really lost it, it's still there. It's there somewhere. It's just a matter of turning that switch on again and relearning that. When I was preparing for this uh, to uh, address the audience here, I guess when you're in a mind frame that you're going to give a talk or discuss something, you even start dreaming about stuff like that. So a lot, tips go last night. <laughs> I am, a, I am a singer, and I guess I wasn't going to wear this hat in my dream, because uh, apparently I was going to sing you guys a Ronnie Millsap song, <laughs> Daydreams About Ninth Things, <laughs> <laughs> which I could. So yeah, you go on, but that's, uh, it's a good thing. I grew up in uh, Goodfish Lake First Nation, Nihio Nation. We speak Nihio in there. And notice I don't say, I, I try to say, stay away from the word Cree. That's not our word. That is a word bought in by the settlers, the foreigners, these people that bought in that word. So I always say nihio. At Blue Colts, when they're in meetings, people will say, they'll say by accident, oh, Cree, and they'll look at me, oh, no. <laughs> and I say, uh, yeah, it's not our language, it's not our, it's not our term. We are people of the four directions, nihio. You wind the clock back 300 years on this land. Would our ancestors understand you if you said Cree? Because they probably wouldn't know what a Cree person is. It didn't exist. It doesn't exist in our language. We are Nihiyog. So anyways, Niga Awewa, my, my mom, she's the person that passed the language on to me. She's the reason why I hang on to this language. And part of this is uh, the work that I'm going to talk about today, the stuff that I'm doing. Uh, I made it my life's mission. And I imagine as many of you, I see many of my colleagues, former colleagues, and see some of our, our language uh, revitalists, uh, people who are working towards uplifting and revitalizing and supporting our languages. So, Miyasen, Tagage. So, growing up, I heard the language. That's the main thing. Mpihtin. I would hear the language, and then I'd hear people that would come visit her speaking the language. So on our kitchen tables, on our living room floor, in our bedrooms, the language was being spoken. That's how That's how the language was, was bridged to us. It was passed on to us. Now, the work we need to do is to start supporting those kind of endeavors, those kind of situations. How are we going to do it? Well, 
We started something here in November of last year. We had a pipe ceremony with uh, our elder Harry watchmaker from Kinogamasig, Kihuan Nihio Nation. We invited him to lift the pipe for us and we said, we want to start something in Edmonton and hopefully which will affect not just Edmonton but other, other treaty areas. We want to start something with immersion. We want kids, especially kids, because this is our target group. This should be our really focusing all our efforts into that. What that lady said there today, at age four, she started formal education. What happened? What dance spike? What happened? She was placed in an institution where Nisto Agasimo, straight English. I was subjected to that same thing. My formal education started when I was about, probably about four years old too. We had play school back then, we had kindergarten back then on our community, so I went there. And then from grade one to grade 12, hope muting it so on. We got bust off the reserve. And of course there, through my uh, 12 years of education, we got spiego, no pihto wao pieg, I see no gani hiwi, gani pig stomagwak, ni hiwi one. So through those 12 years of education, and I'll name the place, Ashwant. It's a little town just outside of our, our reserve, and it kind of straddles between two communities, Sad Lake and Goodfish. And so we were sent there, and we lost, we lost a lot of our, our speech. Not that it can get lost, but we, we forgot. The English language now overtook what we learned at home. I'm grateful. I was grateful for my mom. When we come home, she'd still stay in the language. Of course, she didn't speak uh, very much. And she still doesn't. So we go on with that. Those are things that uh, we learned. We learned that being bust off the reserve, and even our own communities now, I'll even extend it that far. My own nation, they maybe have some semblance of a language program, but that's not enough. I, we were sitting with some uh, Dene speakers around our table earlier today. And they were talking about the Dene language. And they were staying in Dene. And they were saying, our elder there, uh, Linda Manu, said, this is how I felt when I was at Blue Quills. I'd have all these Nihio speakers around me, and I, I didn't understand the word there. I'd understand a little bit here and there. But now you guys know how I feel. And I said, no, that's great. That's great. I said, I love it. I love you guys staying your language if you, as much as you can. Now imagine. Imagine kids doing that, because it's been done. It's been done for millennia. It's from the that, uh, pre-contact, it was done. But now as of contact, now as we get this idea, because of residential schools, and I even go beyond residential schools, because I'm not a product of residential school, indirectly. Indirectly I am, but I am a product of the provincial school system, which was bereft of my language. So for those 12 years, we weren't taught despite the fact that today, that school has like 90 plus percent the children from our communities, Good Fish and Saddle Lake. And yeah, I did actually teach there for a while. I went back there, worked as a liaison, and then I taught the uh, Nihio. I taught Nihio for grade 7 to grade 12 for a few years. 
Uh, it's admirable, Miosin. Kids are learning hapsis, but that's not enough to stem the tide of language erosion. It has to be immersion. It has to be immersion. Kids have to be taught right from, right from this age. These are these are my wakumagan uh, again. This is my family. That's my granddaughter. She's uh, going to be four here next month. It, uh, this one came here by surprise. <laughs> this one here. That's my daughter, in chance. But I think he, she came because she was here to teach me something. So what I do with my daughter, in chance. Waskwe Sigas, who by the way, Waskwe, her name is the birch, the birch tree. And we intentionally picked that name because it's uh, Tree, that tree gives us medicine, and it's strong. It also feeds us. It also puts us on the, on the lakes, on the rivers. We make broads out of it. So she has a good name. So with her, when I'm with her all the time, I speak to her in a language. And she stays in the language. But unfortunately, because I've worked off the reserve, and I worked out of town. I would leave her during the week. She'd go to daycare here in the city. And Nistoaga Asimon, always English. So now she's speaking a lot of English. When I speak to her in a language, she understands everything I'm saying. How? Munska. Tomitsu. Kitasi. So I'll tell her stuff like that, the commands, you know, relevant things. Even tell her, stuff like that. We do that, it's a natural bodily function we do. Things like that, you know, we need to teach our kids. So, as I was saying, in November, uh, November of 2022, I've been on this kick now for at least, it's not really a kick, it's more like a, a crusade, I would say, to revive and revitalize our language through immersion. Uh, this happened about 2018. I worked with Alberta Education for a while. And that's how I got to meet people like my friend here, Eugene. We had a meeting, and we had a, we had a grant go out which would affect Indigenous languages. And so we had one meeting at the Yellowhead Tribal College. We sat there with uh, the then president, Gino Restivo. Italian, by the way, he was an Italian person. He was, he'd have all kinds of signs like this. <laughs> but anyways, I... Uh, as we were talking, preamble, this is before, before our meeting, he was saying, I'm surprised Edmonton does not have an immersion school with all the Nihiog that are here within this, this place. And you know, that kind of got the, the motor kicked in, and he's, he's right. I just visited Amiskwati Academy that time as part of our tour with Alberta Education there in I was saddened to learn at that time, that was 2017, there was no language program there. Why was there no language program there? I mean, they, they focus on academics there. Part of learning a second language you need, you need for academics. So that really spun my wheels and it got me thinking. And we started having meetings in 2018. And then 2019 came along, still meeting, still... Uh, one of the things we were told was, you, it won't happen. It can't happen. You don't have enough teachers. And I thought to myself, later on, did mom have a degree? Did mom have any certificate or paper? Moya, no. She spoke to us in a language, and she stayed in a language. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Today, I speak a little bit up, sis. Day on. For me, that's kind of my motivation and my, my, uh, my mantra. You don't need a degree to actually teach this language. You just need the right amount of people to actually do this work. So anyways, as I was saying about Ashmont School, um, I taught students 40 minutes a day, not producing speakers. You can't produce speakers. You need an all-day program. I'd say even bilingual. Don't worry about bilingual. Let's try immersion. 
But yeah, yeah. So in 2020, 2018, that kind of got the wheels turning. And then the pandemic happened. Kind of, we kind of lost motivation. We kind of lost uh, track of what we we're doing. So then I talked, I noticed my friend outside, Ron Sperling, he said he's not going to be here, but uh, talked with him and he kind of discussed, he works with them in public schools, by the way, and he had kind of heard about our discussion with immersion, so he bought up the idea that maybe work with them in public. And then I thought about it, you know, and then they're talking about having to uh, create all this curriculum, all this other stuff that you need, which is, by the way, we do need create, to create curriculum, but he was also talking about having to certify people and having to give them diplomas. I guess that could happen down the line, eventually. But the big thing we're losing right now, like we talk about our communities, those Dene ladies as we're speaking, as we're sitting amongst them, they were talking about their language. And that lady the, later on was interpreted she said, people our age speak the language still. Yeah, it's big school. But when you get to a certain age already, you're getting a decl declination on the number of speakers. I can say in my own community, if I were to go back right now and try and speak to our young people, they wouldn't understand me. They maybe just say, and that's probably the gist of what they'd be able to get out of it. They wouldn't be able to carry on a conversation. So we need immersion programming. So this is what we embrace. Nehui, a culture institute's philosophy and vision of action embraces these objective, objectives to successfully pass on the Nihio language and culture to our future generation of speakers of all ages. Initially, when we started this work, we wanted to focus just on the kids. But since November, we've been having Saturday classes. Yes, there are kids there. There are kids living. My daughter's there. There's other kids ranging from age 3 to, gosh, 13, 14. And then we have adults. So for me, that kind of flipped another switch. We can't just focus on the kids. As you see here, people want to learn the language. It doesn't matter if they're seven years old or seven years old. They want to embrace the language. I recently did a, uh, an online thing here with Edmonton Public. Uh, we had Ruben Quinn, a Slavic master, by the way, one of the Slavic teachers. And we kind of did a trade-off here with Edmonton Public because we needed a space for, to, for him to teach through our, our university. And um, I made a trade that I would actually teach a course once a month. That's all I could really afford. And uh, so anyways, I go online and I see there's, it's full. People are hungry. They want to learn the language. So the thirst is out there. So for me, I rewrote this, not just the kids, but also everybody of all ages. As I was sitting at my desk last summer, something really got the fire burning again. This book was on my shelf in my room, in my office. Then I looked through it. Is there anything on immersion in here? Sure enough, the very first chapter in this book was by the late Daryl Kipp, who began and founded the Pagan Institute, Utiagamtapaskan, across the border. Into, they, call them, they call themselves Blackfeet Down South. So in there, I took excerpts from what uh, some of the speech was. What his speech was, it was actually to the Stabilizing Indigenous Languages Conference back in, I think it was 1999. He says, my Blackfoot language is a thousand years old and more. Kistano, our language, is thousands of years old. Nakoda is thousands of years old. Nene Sutine has been here on this land for a long time. And in there, he sounded out the cry, 
At some point, the culture ceases to be a culture and becomes an ethnicity. That is, it changes from a life system that develops its own terms into one that borrows almost completely someone else's. This has happened. It's happened to the people down south who were forcibly bought here. They are now an ethnicity. They no longer speak their African language. The 60s, 70s, they started reviving their uh, ethnicity a bit and their culture. As you see with the names, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and then uh, the way some of the people dress with the African dress. But also an element was missing there. They spoke English, American English. So they're still an ethnicity. They borrowed the Moniawak, Muniao's language, and now they're an ethnicity. They're no longer a cult, I would say, like a, their own distinct culture. Because you actually need a few things to be actually be considered a, a nation. You need land. You need governance. You need culture. And you need people. And then the last thing you need is language. I'm also, um, that makes me think sometimes, where are we right now? Where are we right now with our language? If we lose, if our communities start losing it, can we even call ourselves nations? Because we are nations within nations here in this continent. And that's the basis how we operate with uh, the Queen. And with this country, we are nations. Can we even call ourselves, can my community call ourselves, can they call themselves Goodfish Lake Nihio Nation anymore after another 50 years from now? Maybe not. I don't know. I won't be here. But I want to leave something here. So this kind of triggered me. It set the alarm. He's right. The quintessential immersion program is one, a one room, a fluent speaker teaching children in a day long interchange. You don't need people with degrees to do this work. You just need people that speak the language and can stay in the language and impart that language to others. And this applies to everybody. Not just Nihiog. Immersion, as it has been proven, is the best method and means of learning a language. I know I taught in that 40 minute classroom for several years and I didn't produce one fluent speaker. Those that got probably the best out of it are students who actually learned it at home. There were some students that had come into my program, they were speakers. They, their Muslim Gukum or their parents, whoever spoke to them in a language. They would come into for 40 minutes, they got lots out of it because I would actually teach the, uh, teach the uh, orthography, teach the grammar a little bit, and do a little bit of song. So it was, uh, it was beneficial, it had benefits to it, but to those that didn't speak the language at home, it wasn't as beneficial to them as it should have been, as it could have been, as opposed to an all-day all immersion programming. So some of our guiding principles, uh, full-time immersion is the best means of transmitting Nihiyawiwin and Nihiyawiwin. Okay, so there's a difference there. Nihiyawiwin is our language. Nihiyawiwin is our culture. It's who we are. It comprises who we are as as Nihio people. And the foundation of how Nihioiwin and Nihiaun will be taught. To be spoken all along, all the way along with our uh, kids, our young people, and our adults. 
Instruction and dissemination of Nihi Oyun and Nihi Aun is best done by Nihi Oyun. And this is what is said in the TRC. It's also said in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I get tongue-tied when I have a big acronym like that. But uh, we need to do this work. It can't come from out there. It, can't come from, it will not come from Alberta education anyways. It has to come from us as NEO speakers. So we're going to start raising people that are, are supporting this work. It's like this young man that came in. <laughs> There's uh, so much work to be done, so we have to do that work. It has to come from us, by us, for us. Elders, the family, and the community of speakers are essential to the success of the revitalization of Nihi Owen and Nihi Aon. Successful immersion programs need community support and families willing to have their, ch their child learn Nihi Owen first. You got to leave a guy assume one at the door. That's what I do when I do these Saturday classes from 11 till 2. Right now we're housed at the uh, Northwest A Triple I Center. It's not the big building, but across there's a smaller building. Uh, so as soon as I start class, I stay in the language. Take a short break, and after about an hour, hour and a half of, of teaching, some students go, <sighs> meaning that, wow, that's a lot of, lot of language. But it's a way of, for them to express that, wow, that's, you know, there's so much to learn. So we think, when I do things like that, when I do, do, a, do the actual teaching, I'll incorporate things like TPR, Total Physical Response, Nipoe, Ape. And our basic speakers will eventually, you play little, game, little games like that. Simon it well, Simon says, in Nihioyuan. And our eventually our basic speakers pick up that language pick up those terms. Uh, accelerated second language acquisition, the gray morning method. I'll have a picture. Right now we're doing people. I'll put a picture of a man. Are we now? Who is this? And then the students will have, I'll call on individual students. Are we now? Who is this? Of course, I give them that terminology, not people. Oh, Napio, and then I'll see, Anna, that is a man. Who is this? That's, this? that's a man. And Patricia knows all this. She's been through the rigors. Uh, so TPR, and a little bit of PWIM, picture word induction model. Um, that's where you take a picture, and then you kind of label the different parts of it. I haven't done a whole lot of that. Uh, I've done more TPR and more ASLA than I have PWIM. And then there's other methodologies. Uh, there was mentions of uh, MAP, Mentor Apprentice Programs. Those, I think, would be really successful if uh, you can find the people that want to learn the language and stay with an elder or a speaker for five days out of the week, eight hours a day, speaking, hearing, listening, reading, writing, and then finding the, those speakers that will actually stay with them. And then the third thing is to find Uma. You need money to revitalize language. I heard someone say you don't need money. You do. How is that student that wants to learn MAP? How are they going to make a living? Give them a, give them a little bit stipend or something, you know, for them to, to survive off of. And I say survive because I, I know I was a student at one time. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was hard. <laughs> it was very hard. I was probably the same weight that I am right now when I was 30, 31, 32. And then when carrying my backpack and then living on a student allowance diet and then <laughs> walking, with, walking at the U of A back and forth, I, I think I lost about 40 pounds. I think it was about 180 when I, when I graduated from the program. So yeah, you need money. People, some people might say you don't, you need money. We need millions, if not billions of dollars. Think of all the residential schools that went up across Canada. How many dollars are spent there? Today, how many public schools 
federal schools exist that teach predominantly Agayasimun, English. To do this work, we need sonia, we need money. Language to nest and immersion schooling from gated 12 will be a primary focus for Nihui Cultural Institute's existence. NCI will also support and develop instruction for adult families, adults and families who want to learn Nihioiwan. The Hawaiians, the Maori, have been successful in creating language nests. This is where our babies, right from the time they were able to be put into care till the time they start, pre, maybe even preschool. They need to hear the language. You need, we need programs like that. That's going to take dollars. That's going to take money also to find and employ people who will actually stay in the language with our babies, with our young infants, our toddlers. And then we got to find money for K-12. I keep putting it out there. But nothing has really happened right now. We're, we're still working on how it'll look. We're kind of working with Blue Quills also and trying to set up maybe a little bit of a curriculum, what should be taught in a school setting. And we also visited uh, Kihu Weston in Onion Lake here about, actually it was last week. And we kind of, they kind of showed us a little bit of their, uh, their uh, pedagogy, some of their curriculum. So I said, can we borrow some of that stuff? So uh, we're going we're gonna to find them and we're going to ask them, well, we found them, we're going to actually I said, uh, sent him an email. Marilyn McDonald was the, is the principal there. And her comment was, we can't keep this stuff to ourselves. We have to share it. We have to share our stuff with each other. We can't hold back and keep what we, what we, we, we uh, develop. And I'm thankful for that. Also, a shout out to Jean and Eric here. I, uh, at Blue Coals, I use the Niki Oyuin Pasquale Peak Schoon. That's my textbook that I teach at the school there. We need to share stuff like that. Uh, Nihio Cultural Institute will develop language curriculum and develop Nihio language material resources. This is our big vision. I'm shooting for the moon. I'm not playing small anymore. Nelson Mandela said that in the famous quote, how does your playing small serve the world? I'm not going to stand back anymore. I'm going to jump forward. I'm going to jump into this with both feet because I believe our future generation of speakers need this. They need these things. And those of you that are not Nihio speakers, you're, it also applies to your language. Like we saw the young people here speaking today. It would be nice to see other language speakers from the young people, to hear the Dene Sutini, the young people, Nakoda, Anishinaabe, Sutina, Blackfoot, Michif, to hear those young people speak and what's happening in their communities. So we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this work. We're also gonna, and again, Suniao. We gotta find dollars for this. Uh, yeah. We just incorporated here last, we finally got incorporated just before Christmas. We got all those papers in order. And uh, we're gonna apply for grants. Uh, what Daryl Kipp in that book there mentioned is, don't wait for grants. Don't wait for grants, just do it. So if you wait for grants, you wait for all this money, nothing will ever happen. That's why we started these Saturday classes. Right now, I'm doing it out of my own, own pocket, doing it out of my, my own, uh, how would I say this, to put it in a good way, I, uh, doing it because I believe in it. I'm doing it because I want to see the language flourish. And it's just a start for us. I want to be here five days out of the week teaching people. Nehiyoiwan. Finding elders, people like Francis and Mrs. Mrs. Francis. I forget your name there. <laughs> people like that, you know, people that stood up today and spoke in our language. We have to find our speakers out there who are willing to take the time to teach our languages. So this is my big vision. We're going to develop curriculum and we're going to develop resources. NCI will promote the use of social media, podcasts, YouTube eventually. When we find those dollars to do it, maybe we don't even need those dollars right now. 
maybe I think I'll even start. I kind of did somewhat blue quills, and I kind of know what to do. It's just a matter of uh, finding uh, speakers out there who would be willing to be recorded. Uh, and then for the future, media platforms, radio and television, and any other for future forms of media to promote Nehiyewewewen. You know, you rewind the clock here, 30 years ago, was there any YouTube? Were there any podcasts? It wasn't in our lexicon yet. It wasn't in our, we didn't know what those were. But 30 years ahead, who knows what will be out there. We want to employ like what Kevin Lewis said today in Zuam. He said we have to use Instagram, we have to use TikTok, we have to use all these platforms. Our young people employ, this is probably their biggest, in fact it probably affects a lot of us. Because we're doing this a lot nowadays. You know, you see people with head downs on their phones. I'm the same way. So we have to find those mediums and reach out to our young people. And like I said earlier, people want to learn online. Right now at Blue Coals, we have a hybrid program. And it seems to have uh, attracted a certain, certain clientele out there, uh, best way I, can, I guess I can put it. Um, students from far east, east over here. I think I got the right direction here, east, and then uh, down across the border. People uh, from the United States have taken the program. So we have to use those things to, available to us to try and promote our languages. Uh, the four elements of our Nihiyawiwin and Nihiyawun, the intellectual, the physical, emotional, and spiritual, those four quadrants that you see in them, like in the medicine wheel, will be embraced in a balance to be sought in the teaching of our children. Uchito, you have to play those four components. Ceremony, song, those things need to be incorporated in the things that we're doing. That's why it was good to see a pipe ceremony here in the morning. That's how we started with the NCI. We started with a pipe ceremony. And this weekend, we actually did another pipe ceremony. We're getting involved with another group who is going to promote a, an institution here that will be indigenous. And hopefully, they find us a space. They're, they want to work with us, and they want to. The person they're kind of spearheading is, is really uh, pushing our group to say, come join us and be a part of us. Because I think there's support out there. People will support us. We've done some advertising for NCI, but uh, it seems like every Saturday we get a new person coming in. It seems like there's always a rotation. Some people will be there for a while, then they'll leave, then another people will come. And then we have our hardcores. <laughs> some of our hardcores are there from the start. So me, Austin, some of the things we're trying to steep ourselves in are, are the TP teachings, the elder teachings, and whatever term you want to use. Things like kseowatsun, kindness, is what you're doing out of kindness. That should be guiding us as a neo people. Is it kistimun? Is it mutually respectful to one another? Is it sagitun, love? Tapahtimun, is what you're doing, is it humble? That's a big part of our neo culture, is to be humble. We got mami chimso. Not to speak, uh, speak highly of oneself. Uh, then I could go down, I could go down a list, but you can look at it right there. Uh, our Nihio teachings, those are essential. Those are going to be our core of what guides us as, uh, as teachers, as learners, as students. I'm still a student. I'm a student at Blue Coast right now, doing my doctoral, but I, I have, even when I finish that, I'll still be a student. I'll be listening to uh, the mediums out there, such as YouTube. Uh, and people share stuff like Carl Quinn, Ruben Quinn. I'll be listening and picking up some words here and there. Because they tend to use that Ispago Nihonwa. Their Cree is a, that high Cree. He said something the other day I didn't quite understand, but I got I'll figure it out. These things need to guide us as Nihio people. These are our teachings. Not to forget, Nihioiwen will permeate every building that NCI employs. 
I'm not just seeing a school or a K-12 or an adult program eventually happening. I want to see a place, a center, where when you come in, the first thing you hear is Nihioiwin, where our elders can come sit around. Instead of being like, right now, my mom's in a, in a extended care. She wants to move back to St. Paul because there's no speakers there for her. There's no place for her to be out there to engage. And she'd be a, a heck of a resource because of her fluency, because of her knowledge. So for us, we want to we create a space, create a, an area where when students are not in the classroom, they go out into the, into the hallway or into, the, into where the elders are. That's all they're hearing is, is our language. Nihioiwin. This is uh, from Daryl Kipp's uh, the book. Don't worry about children not learning English. It'll happen anyways. It's going to happen. As soon as they leave that immersion environment, what happens? All you hear is English. You look at Facebook, you turn on the TV, you turn on the satellite radio, eh, the radio, or else you're just out in public. It's all around you. You can't lose it. I think that it was a mindset at one time for our, our uh, some of our communities and some of our people. If you speak the language, you're going to get left behind. If you don't learn English, you're going to lose out somewhere. And thus, you know, people started saying, well, instead of identifying that they were from so-and-so First Nation, they would identify from being elsewhere. They became ashamed. They became ashamed of who they are because of the mindset at that time. Thankfully now, we skip mine. That has shifted now. We're now in an age where people want to learn a language. It's not, it's not, don't, you can't, don't have to be ashamed to speak. Or Nakoda, or Dene. Be proud. If I ever hear any other kids speaking Nihioiwen, it's like, Muta Musitan, I feel it right here. Because that kid is going to take the language far. You know, I could have got, I could have gotten lazy, and I could have just talked to my daughter, spoke to her, and just passed on the language like that. But uh, there was a, there was a reminder here last year. Iris Swindler, can still all you guys know Iris Swindler, every horse. She had one grandson, Davis. I think it's coming around about the time of his, the anniversary here. She would often post videos. They went to, I was, met him at a conference here a few years back at uh, Language Keepers Conference. They, they, they passed on the language to him. Davis passed away last year. I think he was like 19 or 20. There was an opportunity there for them to pass on a language to a young person, and they were successful, but that young person is gone now. I didn't want that to happen to my daughter, and I don't want to happen, that happen to my girl. So I said to myself, we need to have an immersion program where her and a bunch of other kids will grow up learning a language. Unfortunately, my, my, the first slide there, my granddaughter, we don't live with her, we don't, we don't interact with her as much as we should. Uh, otherwise, probably would have worked with her in speaking the language. So don't worry about English. Kids will learn it. Language is the key to true self-expression and existence. It's who we are. What I like about Daryl Kipp's book there, Daryl Kipp's speech, do not denigrate your language with argument or even allow the mildest form of violence around it. Practice kseiwatsu and practice kindness. That is what guides us. Currently, right now, we have Saturday classes 11 to 2, drop in all ages free, no registration or fee yet. If it gets to the point where we're bust bursting at the seams, we might start maybe a second class. Uh, that's where we are at the AI Triple C Center at Northwest College. Uh, future residency to be determined. So this is some of what our classes are doing. We do some Simon et Twill. Simon says, there I'm labeling body parts. That's the ASLA, gray morning method. Kigwai oma, kigwai uhe. What is this? What is that? This is a slide of me and my daughter during a class. I'm saying the body parts. She's mimicking what, I, what I'm saying. These are things we envision. 
Language and Nest Preschool, K-12 Immersion, Adult Language Programming, Support for Family Language Learning Immersion Camps. We're planning an immersion camp here for the summer. MAP, Curriculum Development and Developing Supporting and Creating Language Resources for All Formats in Nihi Oiwen. And this is what I wanted to leave you. It's a big speech here by one of our elders, uh, Eva Cardinal from Sad Lake. And there she talks about uh, the indigenous people here were given their languages and they've always resided here. If we lose those languages, we can't run across the ocean or we can't run across here or there to go look for someone else. If the language dies, it dies here with us. We need to revitalize our language. And this is a quote from another elder. Eva was quoting Ag late Agnes Bull from uh, my community. And that's the work that Blue Quills has been doing for the last 50 years now. That's part of the work I do, that I teach, I teach our language. If you ever want to get a hold of me, that's my email address, nehiaunia at gmail.com. So, that's as far as I'm going to go today.